So it's the sugar that's the problem. Sugar destroys all tissue, your brain, your skin, your bones, and your fats, your lipids, your liver, everything. Sugar destroys your tissue. Saw it on research or somewhere. So saturated animal fat is the only thing that raises HDL. Hello and welcome to Beyond the Scale True Healing. If you have been here before, thanks for joining back. If you're new to the channel, welcome. Today, I have the pleasure to be joined by Darren Schmidt, Dr. Darren Schmidt. So he's here to speak about a ketogenic diet. And thank you so much, doctor, for being here today with me. And can you introduce yourself? Yes, you're welcome. Thank you for having me. So I'm a chiropractor. I've been in practice since 1997. I'm in Michigan right now for the last 23 years. And uh, really, even in school, the pur I decided that the purpose of my practice would be um, to be like a chiropractor who focuses on nutrition. So in the chiropractic field, there's uh, like rehab people, exercise people. Of course, there's straight chiropractors too. And then there's a subset of like people who are chiropractors who just want to do nutrition. That's So that's where I fit in. Okay. And so how did you find out about a low carb way of eating and that it was optimal for human health? Yeah, I learned about low carb eating in 1999 from the Weston A. Price Foundation. So I was practicing in Toledo, Ohio, and, and there was an ad in the newspaper, learn about nutrition in our living room. That was the ad. So I, I show up at this house and... and um, it was Rachel and Don Mattis. I mean, Don Mattis is still um, in the nutrition social media. And we she went over uh, the Weston A. Price Foundation and the Price Pottinger Foundation. And what Rachel had said to me that night was the value, like one of the values or the value of eating dairy is for the healthy fats. And I was like, wait a minute, there's healthy fats? And she said, yeah. And so at that point, and I learned about low carb. And from that point forward, I kept my grams of carbohydrates um, pretty much less than 75 grams a day. And if I cheated, I'd be less than 100, 125 grams a day until 2015. So from 1999 to 2015, I stayed on a very low carbohydrate diet. And then I went keto and then I went carnivore. So that's, but that's the beginning. That's how I got into it in the first place. So then you so you transit you transited to keto and then to carnivore and so now you're sticking to a perfect carnivore diet or do you still have some carbs on it? So yeah, I was keto beginning in 2015, <clears throat> cycling in and out, and then August of 2018 went carnivore, and that's been an evolution. So that first year, my in my my rule to myself was eat as much meat as I possibly can every single day. And my also, I was trying to gain weight. I've always been skinny and I, I gained weight. I got up to my highest weight. I was going to the gym. I was eating, you know, two to three pounds of meat a day, which is a lot for me. And it was fantastic. I felt amazing. And actually during that time, I was also detoxing mold. That's a whole different story. But, um, <clears throat> so you're, um, I lost track of your question. What was your question? Of, of my diet is currently 95% of my calories come from meat. Now, but back in the first year when I was eating as much meat as I possibly could every day and going to the gym, I crave fruit about once a month. So I would have like five oranges in one sitting or five apples in two days and it would raise up my blood sugar and then I felt better and my any kind of craving for fruit went away for the next month. And I think I needed that just to restore glycogen in my muscles because I, I was going to the gym so much. And then um, after that year, I changed my rule, personal rule, to eat as much meat as I need or want for the day. So my meat consumption decreased a bit. And um, I'm still avoiding all vegetables. Not that I, if I'm at a restaurant and they give me asparagus, you know, five stalks of asparagus with my steak, I'll, I'll, I'll eat it. But I don't buy it. I don't bring it home. And like I've never purchased bread, rice, brought that home. 
sugar, junk food, pop, never, you know, not since 1999. And, um, so like if I cheat now, it's still, like I said, 95% meat. But if I cheat now, it'd be like low carb granola, which usually tastes bad <laughs> or I don't know the fruit, um, iceberg lettuce. But I think in the last three months, I probably had only one head of iceberg lettuce. Um, and that's kind of it. It's just, I love the sausages and the steaks. And I just, I have a meat grinder and I just processed a combination of four meats. So it was a uh, skirt steak, brisket, heart and liver so I, I shredded all those together and i made about uh, probably 20 patties and actually unfortunately it smells really bad and it tastes really bad but <laughs> i um i'm using mustard and like maybe i, I last night tomato sauce um i've used Wor worcestershire sauce to try to cover up that liver flavor but um man you know i feel so good on it you know yeah so, so that's you're forcing the organs because even if you don't like them, just for the nutrition part of it. Right. And I refuse to take those patties into my office. <laughs> okay. So I have, it's called the Nutritional Healing Center of Ann Arbor. And I got like 30 employees and we're really busy. I do not want to stink up my kitchen in the office with liver. So I actually drove home yesterday for lunch and I had it in my home. But then, but then, you know, in the afternoon, I'm with my patients. I'm like, man, I feel so good. Of course, it's because I ate that pat. Those I had three patties. <laughs> yeah. And just when we started the conversation, you were saying that dairy are healthy fat. So do you implement dairy on your diet being a carnivore now? Or did you remove it from the, your diet? I have some cheese sometimes. Um, and then, but no milk. And I use butter sometimes and that's, that's it. So yeah, I do use some dairy. Yeah. Okay. And do you focus on your fat and protein ratio or not at all? Do I focus on the fat to protein ratio? Yes. I don't measure things out. I used to measure those kind of things out back in, you know, 2015 to 2017, I guess. And, um, but now I only kind of like intuit it based on my work day and how I feel and what I have coming up and, and basically how I feel, do I need to eat more fat? So I'll just add more butter to whatever I'm eating. And even back in like 2008, 2010, I was still low carb and I would deliver. I've, I also deliver seminars to doctors. I've taught, I think I've probably 8,000 or 9,000 uh, people so far traveling around the country giving seminars. But back then there was this very intensive seminar that I would, I gave about 75 times over the course of eight years. And the point is I would teach all day Saturday and then Sunday past lunch. And I realized I needed a steak Friday night, a steak Saturday morning. I needed a steak salad Saturday at lunch. You know, it was all about the red meat. It took me about 25 seminars to figure out exactly what my body needed. If I had a sip of orange juice, my energy went down. And so I was very, very strict for those intensive, very intensive, um, high, high calorie weekends, I should say. And so, um, where am I going? Where, where was I going with that? Okay. So, but that back then I would always put butter on my steak and I'd always get the fattiest steak for that weekend. So that fat gave me the energy, you know, and then of course going to the gym, the protein would keep my muscles up. So I'm always like looking at the serving of that meat or like the sausage. Like if I'm buying sausage at a store, it's going to be low fat, you know, like it's not going to be as good as I got three farmers that I go check out. I live kind of on the country and uh, they have sausages that are actually, you know, food, right? Because their meat, their fat intake or their fat content is so much greater so I'm always considering these things. And then I'm, and then of course the fasting comes in so easily, right? So you have a really good breakfast or whatever, a really good dinner you wake up in the morning, skip breakfast. And I'm, I'm just always like thinking like, how do I feel? How's my energy? Um, what's my next meal going to be like? I'm not always thinking that it's so easy to just, to just ignore food when you're on a low carb meat-based diet. Yeah. And so do you practice some kind of intermittent fasting or 
like naturally or do you force the intermittent fast or what's your best way of heating? So I don't force an intermittent fast. I used to back in 2015 and 16, when I didn't really understand the principles, but now it's just a matter of like, can they easily just skip a meal? And plus I had things to do. So then I just skip a meal. And that's usually would be on the weekends. My work days with patients are Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. So it's kind of rare that I skip a meal during that time I have in the past, but I got to, I got to keep my brain hundred percent powered. So eat three meals a day, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, usually. And then maybe on a Saturday, especially when it's like nice outside, like right now, I got a small collection of cars. I like to collect cars. I got six and I'll like wash them outside and be in the sun and mow the lawn and, you know, and like skip breakfast and skip lunch. And then before you know it, it's dinner time. I've gone 24 hours with no food. And then I'll have, you know, at that time, you know, easily six burger patties, you know, or I've cooked up two big steaks and ate them both at the same time. So, yeah. So it's easy to naturally intermittent fast. Yeah. Yeah. And in your practice, so what do you recommend to your patients for nutrition? For my patients... Okay, everybody comes in with different conditions. So my primary rule is low carb, but yet there are some people who are so sick that they have a hard time extracting nutrition from meat because their digestive system doesn't work very well. And in my case, when I had mold back in 2016, I couldn't eat red meat for six months, yeah. which was like, oh, my favorite food. I just couldn't digest it. I had to detox the mold out. So I learned a lot, even though I was sick, I learned a lot to help other people. But then if somebody has cardiovascular disease, obviously it's like, you got to just go on a meat-based diet. I've had some patients with cancer. Um, this is in, I've gotten in trouble for saying this, but it's the total truth. They reverse their cancer by eating a low carb meat-based ketogenic diet. Um, a couple dozen, let's just put it that way. And I don't treat cancer. There's my legal disclaimer. And um, I feed people, regardless of their health, I feed them the food that their body likes. Yeah. So now there are some people who, um, and okay, some, some cancers will feed on the fat, right? Like prostate cancer. So don't do a ketogenic diet if you have a prostate cancer, for example, and some breast cancers too. So now I have other diets for some other people. So like if somebody has mold in their body or candida, I'll give them the antifungal diet. If they have a you know a lot of virus in their body, I have a, this fantastic antiviral diet, um, and they both allow you know high quantities of meat. Um, we also do like the whole thirty diet, which is like eliminating allergenic foods. Um, so there's just there's quite a number of diets, but you know nobody does well on sugar and white bread and seed oils. So, you know, when you look at junk food, what, what, what's in junk food, you got extra added sugar, extra added bleached flour, seed oils, and then extra added salt. So you eliminate the junk food, you eliminate those four things. And then um, from there, you can tweak the, um, the other grains and the fruits, the vegetables and the meat. Yeah. And um, so you can adapt the diet depending of uh, your symptoms. So with candida, it's a kind of diet and with virus, is another kind, as long as it's stayed low carb. Yeah, exactly. The anti-candida and antiviral diets are mostly about eliminating foods that feed the candida or feed the virus. So that's more about the quality of the food, meaning like cauliflower versus um, junk food, you know, versus potatoes versus meat. Whereas the low carb diet is more about quantities. So I have an equation on my, on the wall of my treatment rooms. And it says, it says qu uh, quantity plus quality equals vitality. So mm -hmm. I'm telling people like, okay, do a low carb diet. So I point at the word quantity, which comes first in that equation. And then other people, I talk to them about avoiding foods that feed candida and i say you have to focus on the quality of your food still do low carb but make sure you're not eating foods that feed candida so i'm just i'm going to repeat that so it's quantity that comes first that's more important quantity 
plus quality equals vitality. Okay. And when you speak about quantity, do you think that people are overeating all the time or sometimes they are as well under eating? Meaning like my patients or? Like your patient, what you see in your practice. And, yeah. Uh, because yeah, I, I have I seen a lot of people under eating in this way of eating, doing low carb. Right. They're under eating protein. Okay. As a general rule in um, modern society, people are under eating protein. And then as far as another aspect of eating, they're eating too frequently. So they're keeping their insulin up um, throughout the whole day. I think the average American is eating, um, I, I heard 14 to 21 times a day. So they're just always snacking. And um, so when you eat the low carb diet, meat based, that's valuable to keep the insulin down, but also to possibly get into ketosis by intermittent fasting and not be up and not be irritable you know, not be hungry, not, not be that hypoglycemic hungry. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. And yeah. speaking about this, uh, people are sometimes uh, advocating for numerous meal with less protein in each to be able to stabilize the insulin, not to have a insulin spike, like eating carniv carnivore meal like four times a day but with less amounts of protein, not to spike the insulin and to stay more in ketosis. Point of view about this? Yeah. Yeah, I think that's fine too. So really there's, there's a couple of ways to go about that. Uh, ketogenic carnivore diet for weight loss and energy maintenance. So I mentioned where if you have one meal a day, dinner to dinner, that, that meal could be super fatty and it could take you two hours to eat it. But what you said is like if you eat four or even six times a day and it's less protein, it's less quantity throughout the day, it's still a meat-based diet and it's still totally fine. It still keeps your insulin down. Yeah. They, yeah. they both work, I think. Yeah. Okay. And I would like to speak a little bit about cholesterol with you. Uh, I saw um, a video uh, with you speaking about uh, cholesterol and how it's important to have some cholesterol. And so can you explain more to the audience why cholesterol is so important and why lacking cholesterol can be damaging? Yeah, so the USDA food pyramid used to recommend a limit on the amount of cholesterol that you take in, but they stopped that in 2015 because the science shows that you can eat a lot of cholesterol and it doesn't affect the amount of cholesterol in your blood. So cholesterol is a nutrient. And the, the reason why it might be bad for some people is because they're eating sugar and sugar is what destroys the cholesterol and turns it into what I call cluster bombs in your body. So it's the sugar that's the problem. Sugar destroys all tissue, your brain, your skin, your bones, and your fats, your lipids, your liver, everything sugar destroys your tissue that's the problem so um i did a video on my youtube channel about the mother of all epidemiology uh analysis on cholesterol so this one study had um a collection of all these um mostly epidemiology on does cholesterol harm or does it help you based on how much is in your blood And what they saw was that the safe range for cholesterol, I believe, was 180 to 240 in American units. Yeah. So if somebody has the cholesterol of, of 230, um, it still potentially might be bad if they're eating a bunch of sugar. So the way that I determine if that's good or bad at that, that quote unquote higher number at 230 or even, or even 240 or even higher, 280, let's say, what you do is you take the total cholesterol and subtract the LDL, and then subtract the HDL, and then you have VLDL. Now, sometimes labs will actually test the VLDL directly. That stands for very low density lipoprotein. Usually they don't. So you have to do your own math on that. And as, as long as your VLDL is less than 19, then you're fine. So let's say your cholesterol is crazy high at 400 because you're Italian right? They have genetically high cholesterol. And then their LDL is crazy high at 300. Yeah. And their HDL though is at 90. So what's 400 minus 300 minus 90? That's 10. 
Yeah. So your VLDL is 10, it's less than 19. You're totally fine. Don't worry about it. Now your triglycerides should also be low and I'm using American units. So let's say your, your triglycerides are 70. That's really good. Okay, now I had a new patient recently and his cholesterol was a little bit high. I think it was 220. And then his LDL was too high and his HDL was low. So therefore his VLDL was over 19. I think it was like 24. And his triglycerides were 160. So they were double what they should have been. Yeah. And I told him, your diet is a little too high carb. And he told me at the beginning, it was he was doing a low carb diet or trying a low carb diet. I was like, okay, we got to get these numbers better. So go more low carb, get into, you know, get into ketosis. So keep your carbs less than 20 grams a day and that should fix it. Okay. This is very, very interesting. And what I have seen lately, and I want to ask you if you have seen this as well, is um, when I switch from a normal carnivore diet to like full range to a lion diet where I'm eating ruminant only and I'm focusing on really uh, ruminant fat, my HDL went up, my LDL went down, and my cruises triglyceride went down as well so I was improving even my cholesterol doing like very ruminant fat compared to butter and dairy for example have you seen this before um have I seen it in my practice I don't know if I've seen it but I've saw it on research or somewhere so saturated animal fat is the only thing that raises HDL yeah and this is so that's awesome yeah. yeah, and this is something that is so funny because uh, the medical community, I don't know in the US, but in France, for example, they are saying that to raise HDL, you only have to eat to eat like olive oil, coconut oil and nut oil. And I never I was never able to raise my HDL with this and with bone marrow and tallow, it went up crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And we, when you look at um, beef fat, for example, I think it's only 40 or 50 percent saturated fat so some people think that, that beef fat is 100 percent saturated it's not and of course don't think that saturated fat from animals is bad it's not bad it's one of the most nutritious foods that you could possibly eat for human beings it's incredibly healthy to eat saturated animal fat yeah and i think yeah there, there is as well a big difference between butter and uh be fat uh yeah with the saturation part of it and that's why we are feeling even better on beef fat compared to butter I, i'm thinking uh, yeah i totally agree with that yeah i usually when i went okay so back in august of 20 uh well summer of 2019 or so i bought a freezer i put it in my garage and um i put half a cow in it and so I also ordered a quarter of a cow. So I had two different farmers and that quarter cow was coming in the spring. So I bought the half cow in the fall and then I had to empty half that freezer in order to get the other quarter of a cow in the spring. So I ate, I ate up all the um, ground meat and then I focused on the steaks. Then I focused on the roasts and it was really cool. I loved it. But what I'm saying is that I was eating so much of the beef, I didn't use eggs or butter for probably six months. You know, there's just no need. <laughs> yeah, it's really what I what, what I'm feeling because uh, I have been on the lion diet for a little bit more than 100 days now. And I don't feel like I, I need anything else. I will go back to other stuff because I'm enjoying eggs. I love eggs. I, 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 oh, I love variety, so I will be out of it. But yeah, I think that you have everything you, you need in beef or lamb, as long as you're eating organs. I'm so French. And so I'm thinking that I'm not lacking any kind of nutrient because I'm eating a lot of organs. But I'm thinking that if you're doing like a lion diet, ruminant only without the, so without the eggs, without the pork, and you're not eating organs, you're lacking some nutrient. Thought about I this. agree. Yeah, I do agree with that. And it's because of my own personal experience. Now, when I was eating a lot of meat out of that freezer, um, 
without the eggs and without the butter, I felt great. But I'm just comparing that with um, like if I just there's a restaurant not too far from me where they have liver, chicken liver at lunch and then the, the beef liver at dinner. And it's a different feeling. It's a better feeling than just having muscle meat. And then I talked about those patties that I made that I got a dozen left in my freezer. And there's a settling feeling. You know, it's a calming feeling inside. And when you translate that to American society, we got people who are just enraged by anything and everything. And I see them on video and it's like, you need to eat some liver, you know, at least start with some double cheeseburgers, you know, without the bun and have three of them, <laughs> you know, and then go home and lay on the couch for a bit, just settle down and then eat, you know, and eat liver, liver and red meat. That's, that's the deficiency in our culture in America right now. And people think it's a deficiency of psychiatric drugs or it's a deficiency of some sort of care. Like, oh, I care about you or I see you. It's not psychology. You know, it's not personality. You know, it's it's what are you eating? So there are people who are so messed up inside physiologically, biochemically, that they cause great harm. Like, I, I can't say words because they that this video will get banned, yeah. you know, but it just it gets that bad. Yeah. You know, and then they and then people go on psych drugs. And right on the label, it says this increases homicidal and suicidal thoughts. It's right on the label. So we need to stop blaming, you know, you, everybody gets blamed. YouTube gets blamed. You know, everything's blamed. But nobody talks about the real problem with the psychopathy in our culture is because our food sucks. It's horrible. And people aren't eating liver and red meat. And they need to eat it three times a day, not just twice a week or something. It's got to be on a regular basis. Yeah. yeah. And you know, I've been, I've been vegan. I know what it is to feel when you're, when you're vegan. And when I reintroduced the meat and when I switched to carnivore, I was craving the red meat and I was craving the organs. And it, it took me three months to get of all the medication, psychiatric medication, because my body and my brain was just fueled by all the nutrients in red meat and organs. And yeah, we don't need to have all this additional stuff. And when I was a vegan, I was supplementing on everything. I was taking, I don't know how many pills, but your body cannot handle the pills. As, as soon as you put back the red meat and the organs into your diet, your psychologic uh, spirit is just blowing. Right. So there's a woman, Dr. Georgia Ede from uh, Harvard. She's actually a psychologist practicing at the student clinic at Harvard. And she um, <clears throat> did a clinical um, recording uh, trial of, uh, you know, you get like a 19-year-old girl, a Harvard student coming in crying and and Georgia says, okay, let's look at your diet. And they're eating soy. And her friend, all their friends are saying, you got to go vegan, you'll feel better. And then Georgia says, eat some meat. And in this uh, t trial of 31 inpatients, 100% of them got better. 100 percent yeah yeah so in the meantime we got the usda and all the nutritionists and dietitians saying meat is bad saturated fat is bad it's like nope 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 it's the sugar it's always been the sugar and harvard was bribed with a lot of money back in the 1960s to promote sugar as a health food you know like there's a lot of damage there by transacting money and then saying the wrong things it's horrible yeah <laughs> it's like what humans do to other humans, you know, for the sake of ego and for the sake of uh, money, just bad. Yeah. And you're, you're quoting Georgia Ede. And I will say as well, we can speak about uh, Chris Palmer currently that is doing as well uh, a lot of research about mental health using a ketogenic diet. And I think this is amazing that now the, a part of the society and the Harvard community is going to, to this low carb diet to help with mental illness and i think that is really amazing yeah chris chris palmer yeah he's he's amazing too i've met both of them yeah, yeah. oh lucky you are <laughs> and uh so if today you have one key 
message to give to the audience, what it will be? One key message to give to the audience. Well, I mentioned eat red meat and <clears throat> and liver. And so liver is the most important food. And then red meat is number two, white meat is number three. Um, I had a new patient yesterday who with congestive heart failure, I said, how often do you eat red meat? He goes, never, it's bad for me. I was like, nope, stop that. You got to, I said, between now and the next visit in one week, I need to eat red meat three times a day. And um, that's the most simplest, basic message that there is. Is like, if you want to repair your body, that's what it takes. So I don't know. I feel like I should say something more grand and bigger, but that's it. Yeah. You know, I and this, the simplicity is the beauty of this diet. So even a, a simplest advice like this, read red meat three times per day, just, just all that we need to yeah. heal. Right. It doesn't have to be steaks this big three times a day, depending on your body. Even if you have a few bites, you know, four ounces or something, and and then, then you're paying attention to how your body reacts to it. How do you feel in the next hour, two hours, four hours, six hours later? Your diet, there's, here's a big grand statement. Your diet is always an experiment. So there are people whose bodies don't like red meat, right? Like, um, as a big, broad, general statement, I'm going to use the word Asians. They're more pork eaters. That's just how it is. And so if your body doesn't like red meat, okay, fine. Do something else, whether it's chicken, eggs, uh, dairy, pork, whatever, turkey. But your diet is always an experiment. So if you're having symptoms, you know, like the weight's fluctuating or whatever, it's an experiment for the rest of your life. And it comes down to you, you eat something, how does your body respond throughout the next two hours, you know, 20 hours, you know, like that. Yeah, fantastic. So I just want to thank you so much for being here today with me and to share your experience and your knowledge with all the audience. And can you tell the audience where they can find you on social media and how they can reach out to you? Yeah, my main platform is YouTube. So just search my name, Darren Schmidt or Dr. Darren Schmidt. And then my website for my office, we we see people locally, they come into the building. We also do distance uh, phone calls and video chat. So we're consulting people who are um, out of state. So our my website is the nhcaa.com. And that stands for the Nutritional Healing Center of Ann Arbor. So the nhcaa.com. And I have courses. I got the keto course, mold course, virus course. And I have a big course called the Seven Step Blueprint to Optimal Health. And that deals with not just the diet, but also um, unlucky exposures. So people are sick for two reasons. They have poor lifestyle choices, which could be diet. And then the unlucky exposures is um, parasites, bacteria, virus, chemicals, metals, radiation, all the Lyme disease. So all these things that you get, like being outside, getting bit by a mosquito, or living in a moldy house, or working in a moldy building or swimming in a pond and you get a parasite. So this seven step blueprint to optimal health, step one is diet. And a lot of people get that already on online, right? They watch you and they watch all these other people talking about diet and they experiment with their diet. And then the next step is preparation for detoxification of, of parasites and mycotoxins from mold. So that's one thing about YouTube and the internet is that there's like one subject people focus in on which is great. And I, it's good. Keep going. But I've been collecting all the things that can make people sick. And then there's a step-by-step -step process. So for example, if you want to get rid of parasites, you have to do that after you prepare your body. And if you want to detox metals, you have to do that after you get the parasites out. So you got to do it in a certain order. Anyways, this 12 step or the seven step blueprint is um, it's also on my website. Some of these courses are free. Some of them, I charge money. Thank you so much again for being here today with me. And if you like this video, please like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. And see you next time.